Hey you, I'm Andy Powell. Welcome to the AllCast Podcast. No topic is off the table. I hope you enjoy. Yeah, so you're on the brink of being a dad. How do you feel? Great. Excited. Excited. Yeah. yeah. Can't wait. We're just, uh, we just have a lot of things at the house that we need to get buttoned up and we're trying to downsize and organize and get the nursery set up. And so my office space, which was already a disaster, now has been pulled out and we're now we're trying to relocate and make things work. Turn it into a nursery? Yeah. 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 So. Right on. Any, any fears or anxieties? Nope. Awesome. No. Dude, that's great. I mean, we want to make sure that uh, being the first birth and we're doing it at home, you know, there's always concerns like what if there's an emergency and then having, to, if we had like a life or death crisis and we had to deal with the hospital, that's my only worry. And so that's going to kind of be the, the foundation of a lot of my prayers and a lot of my thoughts are going to be just, you know, I, I would prefer not having to go that route of, have you that, talked, that worries me. Have but, you talked to the hospital about this type of situation? No, mm-hmm. no. Uh, the midwife is the one kind of guiding us and everything. Oh, yeah. She would probably know how yeah. they would handle a situation like that. Yeah. And we're, we've got a birthing class tonight and so we'll, we'll probably ask her a few questions as far as that goes. Um, especially with the, you know, we've got the RH factor thing going on. The She's a typo negative, I'm typo positive. Mm-hmm. And so <clears throat> because of that, we have to be concerned with the um, basically her body creating antibodies if it's exposed to the baby's blood since the baby will be type O positive. And, you know, that's a concern, but... Well, the only way that she could be exposed to the baby's blood is if there's some sort of mishap, right? Uh, from my understanding, if there is some sort of physical trauma typically is how it occurs Mm -hmm. during the birthing process, there could be like a mixture of blood and she could start producing antibodies. Uh And if that's the case, then we probably won't be able to have more children Okay. because her body will already be sensitized. It'll be too late if we wanted to do a Rogam shot, but we're not doing the Rogam shot now because the, from everything we've looked at, you know, most people in the medical profession are like, you have to get it at 28 weeks and you have to get it at birth. And we looked at the numbers and it's such a, a, low percentage of um, benefit that you know of risk just doesn't make sense plus you don't know where the blood is coming from it's a pooled blood with the vaccines and everything else like I'm not jeopardizing her health I don't know I don't know to the to what extent the vaccines have contaminated people's blood and I don't want to have any issues down the line you know yeah you're still seeing people drop dead from heart attacks all day on Instagram people just falling over did you see the rapper that just dropped I saw that one unreal it's just like, and people are still like, oh, I don't know what happened to him. It's middle. He's yeah. in the middle of his song, falls over dead. Dead. Forty-two years old. That's crazy. Yeah. So no, I'm not doing that. Sorry. We're yeah. Gonna, well, if if we're supposed to have more than one child, then I feel like God will watch over us and we'll get through it, and we won't have an issue. And if so, then if we're only meant to have one child, then we have one child, and that's it. We put all of our time and energy into making that child the best person we can so yeah with those vaccines and all the all the hospital style birthing stuff it's like it's great they got it pretty streamlined yeah but they they parrot a lot of things that are probably just you know not worthy of being parroted well they have protocols that they've set that have been set for a long time without any actual trials or any any further evaluation so it's like this is how we do it and that's it and it's the same with cancer treatment they can't look at any other anything outside their scope of um you know, of what their protocols have been set. So they can't offer really any vitamins or diet or anything along with it. It's like, take this chemotherapy medication. And if you step outside the box and you go too far towards like a Gerson therapy, then you lose your license to practice. And that's, it's crazy. So when I was in the hospital with my dad, that's what was frustrating to me. It's like the doctors had their protocols and they couldn't veer outside. And because they're, most of them are cunts, sorry, pardon yeah. my language, but oh, like bring on. they are, so fixated on making money and just doing what it takes to like paying for their bins and their big house. And I'm speaking very broadly, obviously I'm going to piss some people off with that comment, but I had much better dealings and I felt like a lot of the nurses were better educated than most of the doctors. Yeah. And the doctors I dealt with had such egos and were such assholes in my opinion. Um, I mean, that's again, going back to COVID, we got to see how, a lot of the doctors just parroted what they were told. They mm-hmm. didn't think, they couldn't think on their own and they were forced into these kind of narrow, um, they had very narrow opinions 
and they weren't allowed to say anything more and they didn't want to rock the boat. They didn't want to lose their license. And so That's they the shut thing. up and went along with it, which in my opinion is malpractice and they should all lose their licenses. That's what I was going to say. Even, even, <clears throat> um, with just cancer pre COVID, yeah. If you're telling somebody, well, this is the only route you have yeah. without looking at nutrition or anything else, that's malpractice. Absolutely. And, yeah. and my dad, so when my dad, it's, it's a long story. Um, initially, he was in the hospital because of a heart attack. He had a low-grade leukemia that they said would have been with him his entire life. He, he would have died with it, but it wouldn't have been the cause of death. His oncologist basically forced him into, through fear, forced him into taking um, – chemotherapy scared the shit out of him and he that the last when my dad told me that he was considering chemotherapy i'd just done six weeks in the hospital with him after a heart attack i was stuck arguing with people that were considered professionals and like authorities on you know like a neurologist who at one point said my dad was septic and we had to do a spinal tap gave him a 50 50 chance of surviving and i told him absolutely not they'd give him a drug that they lied to us about i called them on it. I said, this is, it was, um, it's an antipsychotic called, forgive me. I'm, I'll think of it in a second. Um, and I can pull it up on here if you want to find out. What yeah. Well, yeah, just give me a second. I'll, I'll probably recall it, but basically they lied to us. They said they weren't giving him any new medication. He went from coming out of a coma. He had an induced coma from having, um, it was a widow maker heart attack. Fortunately, he was at the hospital when he finally, when it hit him full on. And so they were able to induce a coma. And then after a week, he came out of the coma, started making progress. Once he was making progress, I, I'd flown down from Washington to stay in the hospital with him. So I was in there with him 24 hours a day um, and trying to help them figure out what's going on because he was obviously in bad shape. They were using a impella to pump red blood cells back through. I, I forget. Again, it's been four, five years now. I'd have to like sit down and like revisit all my thoughts because I understood it pretty well then because I was kind of immersed in it. But um, they were doing these treatments. And so I just sat on the computer and read all day and was trying to figure out ways to get him out of this kind of comatose state. As he was coming out, he was kind of slow the first couple of days. And then he started getting better and better. And so as soon as he got better, I was like, I'm going to step out of the hospital for a couple of days and take a break because I'd been in there for seven, seven or 10 days straight. And sleeping on the floor, they gave me a pillow and I slept on the floor with a pillow and blanket. You know, I mean, hospitals aren't the cleanest places, regardless of no. what they say. There's needles on the floor occasionally that would drop things. I mean, it was kind of shocking, but took a few days off, came back and <clears throat> noticed that my dad was no longer tracking me with his eyes. When I came in, I was like, okay, I'm going to come back and he's going to be in great shape. My brothers were there watching him and First thing he came into the room, I was like, hey, dad, how's it going? And I noticed that like he turned, but his eyes couldn't track me. And there was like a, a shaking going on in his eyes. And I was thinking like, God, oh, that's really weird. But, you know, this is, you know, he had a massive heart attack. This is probably how things go. It progressively got worse day after day. And by day three or four after having returned, he started getting uh, something called tardive dyskinesia. So his tongue had curled up into like a clover leaf in his mouth. He was losing the ability to like breathe. He was gasping all the time because he couldn't breathe right because of his tongue. Um, he lost the ability to track me at all. He was confused, didn't know what was going on. <clears throat> and as it progressed, I was obviously asking doctors questions. I was like, could this be a stroke? Could this be um, some sort of, uh, you know, could this be a result of having lack of oxygen to the brain from the impella? destroying red blood cells. Could there, you know, are we seeing something that's caused by lack of oxygen and permanent damage or is, you know, what are we looking at? And all I got was, well, he had a traumatic event and this is normal. So you're finding things online, information that could be indicators of what's <clears throat> happening and you're running it by the nurses and doctors Asking and they're just everything. like, eh, maybe, probably maybe. not though. The, the, the resounding answer I got was, um, this is what happens when people have traumatic events. I went, okay, got it. But let's see if we can figure out what to do now, you know? So I found this one study and they use, um, oh, it's a, it's a nootropic common, I almost said minoxidil, but what's the, uh, modafinil. Hmm. So I found a study that they use modafinil on people that had gone through something similar and had had hypoxia and some brain damage. And they found that the modafinil helped to, to bring their cognitive abilities back. Hmm. So <clears throat> You start slipping stuff into his IV? Not yet. No. <laughs> um, 
So I, I questioned the nurse and I said, hey, I found this study. Nothing else seems to be helping him. He's getting worse. Um, by the way, I, I was asking at this point, I'm like, what are his vitamin D levels? Can you check his like B vitamins in his blood? Can we just see like what his, and they're like, oh, well, we normally don't do that. And I'm like, that's the problem, lady. Yeah. Lady, a male, male nurse at this that, point. That's the problem, sir. Yeah. So they don't know his vitamin D levels, which is crazy because that's responsible for 200 or 2000 plus metabolic reactions in the body. I believe something like that. So when was the last time that the medical field in the West was adaptive? Couldn't tell you. Probably, um, probably before the, uh, AMA was formed, I would assume. Yeah. Because then they started writing, you know, they, so I think it's allopathic medicine is our current medicine model. And the former was, um, again, forgive me. I haven't, I haven't read about this in so long. So I'm, I'm really, I'm having a hard time recalling the different, different, um, names, but prior to the American medical association, doctors relied more on, you know, food, nutrition, kind of old school methods of like sunshine, proper diet, exercise, common sense, common sense. Now it's more parameters and protocols. Pharmaceutical. So pharmaceutical companies write all the the literature for doctors to use now. So why do you think doctors go straight to prescription medication? And this is something else for people that haven't dealt with cancer, or maybe they have and they don't realize it, but oncologists are able to buy all of their drugs, all the chemo, the um, chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapy drugs at wholesale and market up to whatever they want to. They set the prices. So they make such a huge percentage off of that, that why do you think they prescribe it? I mean, again, and they're forced in this narrow window of like, this is what you can and can't do. So mm-hmm. they don't look at anything else. You might find some good doctors that, that recommend doing something like a low sugar diet with like more sunshine and like activity. But most of the time it's like, Oh, just rest. You can eat. They're giving my dad ice cream in the hospital during all this, by the way, when he was coming out, I'm like, what are you guys doing? You know, he just had a massive event and he's having cognitive difficulties and you're trying to feed him ice cream. So I cooked food every day. I would leave in the morning. I would cook food at home, drive it back to the hospital and then stay the rest of the day, come Mm -hmm. back at night, do the same thing. Mm -hmm. So going back to, when he started losing his cognitive abilities and I could see this and I was like, okay, something, something traumatic is happening. I asked the doctor or the nurse about the modafinil, the modaf, uh, the nurse then said, well, I need to call his primary physician and make sure it's not going to conflict with anything else that he's taking. I said, all right, okay. I already looked at everything that you gave me the list of, and there shouldn't be any, con- you know, there's no contraindications. There's, there shouldn't be any problems with these other drugs. Um, calls a doctor and the doctor says, no, he can't take it because it's going to conflict with the, uh, Risperdal was the other drug. Is, is that the antipsychotic? That's the antipsychotic. And why, so why were, so he was on an antipsychotic before the heart attack or that no. was, that was the one that they added in and didn't tell you. They about waited it. till I left for a couple of days because they knew I was asking about everything. I was like, Hey, I want to see everything you're giving him. I want to understand like why you're giving him this at what milligramage, like, Walk me through everything so I can understand what's going on because I need to help because it's, my dad's getting worse and you guys aren't able to fix it. So maybe I can at least find something. It was just a shot in the dark. I mean, it was obviously, I was under a ton of stress. I was, I didn't know what to do. I was watching my dad basically die in front of me. And so. <clears throat> Why would they give him an antipsychotic? Their answer was because he said he missed his dogs and he was obviously distraught and wanted to, He said, I miss my dogs. I want to go home. And so they gave him an antipsychotic. So my brothers were there. <clears throat> they were very trusting at the system at that point. And I don't blame them at all because it's who, who would, you know, who's going to ask all these questions. So they did it when I was gone. I came back. They told me about the Risperdal. And I said, well, what is Risperdal? I'm not familiar with that. And I don't see it anywhere on the list of medications you gave me. And that's when they said, oh, it's, you know, it's an antipsychotic for people that get, you know, upset or, or, um, are feeling anxious. I said, why would you give this to my dad? I'm like, well, you know, he, he said he wanted to go home and he missed his dogs. And so we wrote the prescription for it. Yeah. Yeah. In a hospital. He's Dude. been in the hospital now for, 
it was t- probably 10 or 12 days at this point. You know, he'd been in a coma for at least a week. So you shouldn't have feelings of wanting to go home and see things that exactly. are people that you or creatures you care about. No, what this is is doctors get kickbacks and all this bullshit. Yeah. And so So they find whatever whether whether they it's can. talked about or not, they do. And they get they get I used to date a girl that was in the pharmaceutical industry and all she did was take doctors out to dinner and give him all kinds of special shit for pushing her products. Mm-hmm. So um so they'll look for reasons to give them whatever they can. Whatever they can. Yeah. And of course, this is once again general. It doesn't apply to every doctor. Some of them do have a conscience, but the overwhelming Few and majority. far between yeah. is my experience. I, I think once you go through medical school and you're saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt in some cases, it's real easy to make excuses for doing the wrong thing when you're trying to pay bills. Yeah. And I think that might be part of the game, right? <clears throat> so... They tell me about the Risperdal. I ask what it's for. They tell me. I'm like, that seems pretty unreasonable. This coincided right at the time when my dad started having issues. So I pull up my computer. I start reading about Risperdal. Well, side effects are tardive dyskinesia. All the, all the symptoms that my, my father's having. Um, it's not recommended for geriatric patients. It's not recommended for people that are hypotensive naturally. My dad naturally had very low blood pressure. And so I was like, I don't understand. You guys got to pull us. Well, you don't, you don't understand. He needs to be on it. This is something it's given to everybody. It's very common. So they kind of talk me out of it. I'm like, are you sure? Because he shouldn't be on this. I think this is what's causing a problem. So I, I voice my concerns. They blow me off. That night I went home. Now I've been sleeping in the hospital again for another, at least probably another four five, six days. And my dad's been getting worse and worse every night. I woke up one night to a nurse kind of manhandling him. She was frustrated because he was writhing around. Now his, his, it moved from just heart of dyskinesia into like cerebral palsy almost. His right arm was curled up, couldn't move. It was fixed at his chest. He could barely breathe. He was moaning, twisting around all night. So the other thing hospitals do is they keep lights on 24 hours a day, which if you know, if you're not sleeping, you're not healing. So I would put a washcloth over his eyes at night and I would put in because everything's beeping and making noise and they don't take any consideration for the patient's rest, I would put in earphones with classical music on loop all night to try to cover up some of it. Well, he was writhing around and she came in and I caught her like shaking him and like getting angry. And I was, it's a difficult position because you can't rock the boat too much or he's going to get worse treatment or you're going to get kicked out of the hospital. And so it was obviously incredibly frustrating. And so managed to calm her down a little bit and helped, you know, I would help change him and help do, you know, I was basically an assistant in the hospital every day, 24 hours a day for all these people while the nurses were doing things. So I think it was the following night. Um, it was after four or five days, things are getting worse. Find out about the Risperdal. I have not slept at nights because I'm up all night with my dad trying to protect him from angry nurses and make sure he's comfortable. If he moves, I'm up. So I'm finally like, I've got to go home and get some sleep. I'm falling apart. I'm like getting sick. I feel like hell. The first night I go home, I was sleeping on the, my parents' floor, this hardwood floor in, in North Hollywood. And we're only about 10 minutes from the hospital, which is really nice. But I finally get to sleep at, I think, 11 p.m. And at 11.30, we get woken up with a phone call that we're losing my dad. They're losing my dad. So... Wake my mom up, throw her in the car, fly to the hospital. We watched my dad basically expire in front of us. His blood pressure crashed to zero and he, they had, I don't know what they resuscitated him with because we were outside watching him work, but they were able to pull him back. And so now I'm like, this is absurd. This is the medicine you guys are giving him, you know, 100%. Everything is falling into the the side effects with this drug. It coincides when you gave it to him. I want him off this drug. You don't know what you're talking about. Go home tonight. They, they get him get him back right, to sleep. Right after he just almost died. Yeah. So we go home. Get to sleep at two, three in the morning. I don't I don't remember what time it was. It was late. Get a few hours of sleep in. Go back down in the morning. No, I'm sorry. I think I I can't remember if I was called again. I believe I was called again that they're losing my dad again in the morning. Get woken up with that call. Fly back down to the hospital. Same exact thing. We walk in and they're trying to resuscitate him. My brothers are on site now. 
and I'm talking to my older brother and I'm like, this is the drug they gave him. And my brother, two of my brothers are deputy sheriffs. One was a sergeant. So they're very, you know, and again, this is not knocking my brother at all. One of the, they're the greatest men I've, I've ever known, but very much in the system. And he was yelling at me, you trust the doctors. You don't know what you're talking about. I've never talked back to my brothers in my life. And I'm screaming at him in the hallways. And we're walking down the hallways. Like I'm getting ready to be, I'm like in fight. I'm in go mode. I'm so fucking angry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we walk in. It's the same thing. They res resuscitate him. And I'm like, those doctors aren't allowed near my dad anymore. My dad's not to be given this drug anymore. The, it, and by the way, they're telling me, I forgot about this. I, so I have to backtrack a little bit. They told me it can't be the drug because we only gave it to him one time. And I said, I still believe it's the drug. And they said, no, he's only been given to him one time. It can't be the drug. So I'm like, the doctor doesn't come near my dad anymore. I want medical records ordered. So I sent my mom down to get med medical records ordered. We got the records back that night. They'd given it to him every single day. They lied to us about it. The day I said, the doctor doesn't get near him. He's not to be given anything unless it comes through me. That's the day they ceased it. Within the time that they ceased it, to him starting to recover was 12 hours. By that night, after ceasing the Risperdal, he started coming too. I walked into the room and he actually looked at me for the first time in like almost two weeks. I think it was maybe a week to 10 days maybe. And uh, yeah, so that gives you an idea of how this medical system works. They will lie to your face. They do what they want. They treat you like you don't know anything. Um, cut to several months later, my dad started having kind of echoes. We got him out of the hospital. Long story short, six weeks in the hospital from beginning to end this first time get him off all of that, get him through his rehab, get him home. Several months later, he started having flashbacks of the Risperdal, the same thing. Same symptoms like, kind of coming back. Really? Out of the, And I don't know if that's if that's a common trait of the antipsychotic. I would assume it probably was just because of the, the way the brain works. I've heard of other things like this, like echoes of it. How do you suppose that functions in the I don't know. body? I don't know. I don't know if it stays latent or if it just caused something causes something else to be off but interesting he started having weird spells a few months later goes back in the hospital and now his oncologist is like oh we've got to do chemotherapy and so i talked to him i'm up in washington talk to him you know he tells me he's going to go on chemo i'm like dad please we i just spent six weeks getting out of the hospital <laughs> i had to argue and fight with all these doctors it was tough please let me just do a little bit of research on this before you jump into it because that's once you're committed to this that's it and he said, sorry, I trust my doctor. He's a good guy and I'm doing it. And I said, okay, it's your choice. And so we lost him two weeks later. And just frustrating. Yeah. <clears throat> Towards the end, when now I was doing the same thing, coming in, cooking twice a day, coming back and forth. During that chemo treatment During time. During the chemo. I was cutting his hair in the hospital, cooking all his meals. I mean, and again, I had a nutritionist come in trying to feed him ice cream and brought in like all these desserts. And I was like, are you, are you out of your mind? Like, who do you, like one, the nurse came in with it. I said, I don't want any more of this crap coming to his room. I don't want you guys putting any junk food in front of him. I was like, you've forced him onto chemo. He's barely hanging on. The last thing he needs is sugar right now. You're feeding the disease. Exactly. So, the, the nutritionist for the hospital came up to try to talk some sense into me. And I basically put her in her place. And I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how you have this job. Yeah. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know if I even said that out loud to her. I was being pretty middle of the road trying to keep the peace there. Mm -hmm. But I was like, he's not eating ice cream. Sorry. And yeah. I made sure it was very clear. I actually threw one of them against the wall one day because I was so pissed off. Yeah. I kept bringing it up and just left a mess in the room because I'm like, I'm done with these people. Yeah. But at the end... My dad's, I don't know if they're his exact last words, but it was at the last couple sentences, the day he could still talk because I could see him sliding downhill. He said, I think I screwed up. With the chemo. With the chemo. And I was like, yeah, well, dad, you made your decision. There's nothing we can do now, so we're going to have to ride it. Yeah. And I was still trying to find ways. I was still trying to order uh, labs to try to figure out what was going on, if we could pull him back. And his primary doctor came in and said he's got two days. And that's when I was just obviously crushing I said, I don't understand, you know, and 
his primary doctor said, yeah, he should have never been on chemo. <laughs> I was like, they got to consult the primary care physician for the antipsychotic, but not for the chemo because the way the system works, yeah. that doctor won't step on the other doctor's toes, even if he knows it's wrong. So I pulled the nurse Whoa. aside and I said, what the fuck is going on? Because I was getting pretty close to all the nurses. They've seen me there for several months now. And the nurse I pulled aside outside broke down in tears. And she said, this doctor does it to everybody. He puts everybody on chemo when they shouldn't. He has a palliative care team and a hospice team that he runs as well. So he puts people on chemo. He has a hospice team come in and then he offers end of life care with his palliative care team and he makes a fortune and he does this to everybody. So he's using the system to kill people and profit off. Of exactly. It. Is that guy still practicing? I assume. I wrote to a couple different attorneys in the hospital and never got any word back from anybody. And at that point, I just went from my for my mental health and for my families, because I was, I was obviously thinking some very, the day my dad died, I was leaving the hospital and that doctor crossed the street in front of me in the crosswalk. And I was a hair away from running him over and dragging his body down the street. What stopped you? I don't know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I just, none of my, just none of my makeup, but um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So then after that, you just kind of let it go. Cause focused on trying to take care of my mom. Yeah. Keeping her sane. I was living in Washington at the time. So making, you know, several, maybe a half dozen trips a year back and forth to visit. Um, about a year later, I started noticing serious cognitive decline with my mom mm -hmm. and then had to move her up to Washington to take care of her. We started noticing some dementia. Um, this is the funny part. Found medications that she didn't know she had in her drawer. And one of the side effects was dementia and mental cognitive. Yeah. Prescription drugs that that primary care physician had put her on now too. Whoa. So, dude. but the lead what? up to COVID. So obviously by the time COVID came around, I was locked up in crazy Washington with a bunch of nut jobs. So by the time COVID came around, I was like, every time the system, I know this, I know this song and dance is bullshit. This isn't going to be two weeks. Yeah. I can, I can tell you enough about health at this point to know that they're telling you to stay inside and not get sunshine. Well, everybody knows that that's a great way to weaken your immune system. They did everything contradictory to what keeps you healthy, sane and, and you know, like I said, there was no no doubt in my mind within a week. I was like, well, let's ride this. Let's see. Let's give it a week, a couple mm -hmm. weeks to see how this plays out. Maybe it's bad. Yeah. But after two weeks, I was like, this is horse shit. This doesn't yeah. make any sense. Yeah. It wasn't at all what they said it was no. initially, but people just kept drinking that Kool-Aid all day for some reason. Fear probably fear. Just but because the medical professionals that everybody trusted fell in alignment, they didn't ask questions. They were afraid to get out of their lane and everybody that did, was vilified and they were silenced on social media. Mm -hmm. I, I was spending somewhere between two and six hours a day talking to whoever I could to try to figure out answers to this, listening to podcasts. Spoke to a guy who modeled um, the software for uh, funeral homes nationwide. And he was the one who really was like, I'm looking, he said, I'm looking at all the data. And he's like, everything that's coming in is like bus accident. This is like, you know, trauma to the body and it's getting labeled as a COVID death. I, the, all the things that we know now, I was getting early on and trying to argue these points to people and I was told I was a conspiracy theorist. I didn't know what I was talking about, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here we are in 2023 and I'm still carrying a bunch of this frustration. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, because you were right. You're seeing the injustice of it all. And the injustice is what Being told that yeah. you're crazy when obviously you're not. Yeah, but you know, a lot of people were in the same boat. But that's yeah. what brought me to Prescott. So, not to be too long winded, I'm sorry, I've kind of run, no, dude, run off on a tangent. Keep going, you're good. This is, these are, you're answering all the questions I would have asked anyway. The, the thing I come back to is <clears throat> how God works in your life and what He gives you to the things He puts, He, he outlines your life for you. And if you, pay attention and you, and you watch for the signs and you make the right choices. You know, I was in a relationship that wasn't working. Um, 
came back to my faith. I kind of walked away from faith for like 20 years, kind of talked myself out of it, you know. Like I think a lot of people do. You look at it and you're like, ah, logically, there's contradictions. It doesn't make sense. And my dad was incredibly faithful and very, very involved with the church. He was at a church function when he started having his heart attack and one of the girls drove him to the hospital. That's the only reason that he was saved is because she took him to the hospital instead of waiting for the ambulance. But while he was in the hospital, I would pray with him. And that was... That was the first step. And had he raised you in, uh, in Christianity? When I was young, it wasn't, it wasn't really anything that we even discussed. Um, I went to a Lutheran church in junior high and that was kind of stepping into it. Uh, we moved to Texas when I was a teenager and I went to a Baptist church that was kind of where the community was at. A lot of the younger, a lot of the kids were going there. So I always kind of had faith, but I don't know. It was always kind of in the background, read the Bible on my own, did things on my own <clears throat> out of curiosity and just feeling drawn to it. But once I turned 19, 20, moved back to Los Angeles. Most people in LA are atheists. And, you know, I kind of, you know, moved into working in nightclubs and you know, just kind of a self-serving asshole to be blunt yeah. and convinced myself I knew better and ignored my conscience and just, you know, just wasn't, just wasn't a great person. So <clears throat> once he got sick, I kind of came back to it. This is 2018. He passed. And then when 2020 hit, like I said, after a few weeks, I was like, this is so evil and so twisted. This is so, it feels like so much more than just just fraud and just, you know. Yeah. I think you and I probably saw it similarly at the time as far as it's so obvious. Yeah. It's so obviously bullshit. And it felt evil. When you're yeah. watching people lie that you know, actually understand what they know what's going on. Hmm. Because if I can understand it, these experts can understand it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, I started praying, I think, around November, December of 2020 is when I really started like picking up the Bible again and listening to like, I got drawn back to revelations because there's so much interesting stuff in revelations. And when you start looking at like, okay, things are getting like biblically <laughs> twisted right now. Like things are getting really crazy. I'm like, okay, well, revelation seems like a good place to start. And so I started listening to that at night praying. <clears throat> and as soon as I did that and started try I, I moved away from trying to control my life so much and just started asking for help and things one after another just started you know my mom got ill with dementia had to move her up to washington which began the divide with the relationship that wasn't working out well up there so it opened the door for this to happen and at the time it was stressful and hard and obviously kind of heartbreaking um but it opened that door for her care which then moved into finding a better place to live because she, you know, again, on far leftist Island, there's just not a lot of opportunity for, Oh, you're on an Island up there. Yeah. We're in Vashon. Okay. <clears throat> Beautiful Island, but very, very, very leftist mentality. And if you don't think that way, you're not part of the group. And there was a handful of people that I could consider friends of the Island and everybody else looked at me like I was, you know, no. I wasn't one of them. So I found Prescott after looking nationwide and, and it moved us here. And within a few months, I met Natalie, my, my new wife. We've got a baby <laughs> on the way. It's like, it's you know, okay. incredible. Kind of got set up into a good spot pretty quickly, huh? Yeah. But it was as soon as I stopped trying to force everything in my life and yeah, you know, the idea of, <clears throat> of letting go and having faith is really difficult for people that are, you know, that, that I think are, I don't know if I'm a type A personality, but I'm, I like having control over my life. And so I feel I've always been the, the kind of person that's like, I'll figure it out. I'll do it on my own. I can handle it. I can do it. And so to let go and have enough faith to say, okay, God, I need help. It's tough. But as soon as I did that, it's like, 
doors just started opening and it was like the most miraculous ways things just line themselves up. So yeah. that's amazing. <clears throat> amazing what happens when you surrender. Yeah. yeah. And you grew up in California. Yeah. How You're, old were you when you moved up to Washington? Um, well, I grew up in California until I was around 13 or 14. Oh. I was getting into a lot of trouble, ditching school. I was getting, you know, mixed up with kids that were, I was hanging out with kids, you know, four or five years older than me and drinking and smoking pot and, you know, just being a jerk. So my parents, and I had a very overbearing grandmother that was not healthy to be around. And so my parents decided to be good to move me to Texas, moved to Texas for six years, moved back to California when I was 18 or I think 19. And then... Um, I mean, there's a bunch of moves in between. I ended up in North Carolina for a year. That's a whole other thing. But I moved to Washington in 2015 when I could see California was kind of coming off the rails. I was just seeing, you know, that was during the Trump and Clinton, you know, building up to that election and the cops weren't doing their job in the neighborhood. And I'm running homeless people out of, you know, abandoned buildings next door and they're throwing trash in their yard and I'm finding needles. And it was getting to the point where it was just, you know, you just can't live that way. And so uh, I convinced my girlfriend at the time to move back up to Washington where she was from, to this island. Mm -hmm. And then you and, were there uh, for how long until? I think five, five or six years. And then you moved to Prescott? Prescott, yeah. Right on. Yeah. Wow. So when you started reading more about uh, revelations and kind of seeing some commonalities mm -hmm. uh, with COVID, were there were there any specifics that stood out to you as far as this is what's happening? I mean, I think it's the same thing that everybody gets out of Revelations, right? You look at the, I, th I believe it's in Revelations, but the the mark of the beast on the right hand or the forehead. And, you know, you're hearing about these digital chips. As soon as the COVID passport thing, you know, yep. I was like, okay, this, is, this isn't about safety anymore. This is about control in there. Whether or not this is some biblical prophecy, I'm going to at least read it and try to understand it because... Nothing else makes sense right now. Yeah, and at least that way, if it's not, you could rule that out and move yeah. on to the next possibility. Yeah, just trying to wrap my head around it. Mm -hmm. And to get into, you know, it's obviously a lot of, um, I don't know, you know, trying to interpret revelations is, isn't exactly easy. Yeah. There's a lot of metaphors, and you, you have to ask yourself, is this, you know, what is the symbolism? So I was trying to read more into that and understand other people's approach to it and their... Um, explanation you know just trying to dig around for the truth and understand it you know like i said i was just coming back to faith again and, and praying and asking for guidance and so that was um you know the first step and the most palatable way to get into it because i found it really interesting too mm -hmm. yeah that's something that when i first really came across revelation i was staying the night at my friend's house and i was like 12 or 13 years old mm -hmm. and he wasn't a believer but I was, you know, fully, I'm going to say, indoctrinated into Christianity from, mm. from childhood. And, um, and to put some contrast or some context on that is, you know, I, now I'm a Christian and it's my choice because I've lived life for many years without being a Christian. So now I understand it and I'm choosing it rather than being born into it, I suppose. So that's the difference there. But but he showed me revelation, not being a believer. He's like, you don't know about this? And I'm 13. <laughs> like, no, I've never read the book of Revelation. We start reading out of it, and it scared me to death, man. It scared me so bad because I had some sort of a, a visceral response and an understanding that like, oh, that's the time we're in. And that's one reason I'm I'm here. I'm here for some reason to be a part of whatever's unfolding in this book that correlates to life right now. And even to this day, I, I see a lot of commonalities, but I don't know, you know, specifics. So I ask myself, well, what do I do? What can I do? Just, well, I'm just one person. There's so many people. There's so much stuff, like you said, I can't control. Mm -hmm. So it really boils down to, well, how's my relationship with God? And how am I impacting those around me? And how am I feeding and building myself to be a better light and an example in this place during dark times, during times of fear. COVID hit, I saw kind of right through it. It's like, okay, well, this is obviously BS. So 
what do I do? I just, I, you know, I walked around in confidence, not in fear. I was more in fear for people's response to it than for any kind of a viral infection or whatever. And I got COVID and I, you know, kind of knew what was going on and, and treated it. Um, what did I do? I didn't get vaccinated. I didn't really take any medications. I took an Epsom salt bath. I rested. I got some sunlight <laughs> and, you know, within, within one day, it was real mild within one day, but it was, a, I could tell that it was different. There was something in my like head and in my sinuses that was like, this is not normal sickness. I don't know what it is, mm-hmm. but it's something, something else. Did you lose your smell too? I did lose my, uh, my sense of smell. Yeah. And um, I th- maybe my sense of taste, but that was only for a few hours. Hmm. So I think I had it for one day. Yeah. But yeah, the you could tell. You could tell something was different. I was like... Not a normal cold. Not a normal cold. and uh, But nowhere near what everybody was making out to be. And yeah, stories you heard of people in the hospital just turning blue or I don't know. I mean, it, in certain cases, there was some issues. I had a friend who actually almost died from it. He was like... He was on vacation, um, I forget which islands he was in, but they didn't have a good medical system. And I don't know how they first treated it, but he ended up, you know, he wrote out his last will. I was talking to him in those like final days and he didn't think he was going to make it. And we were all concerned. We were trying to find places like hospitals to fly him back to in the States to get him treated. And thank God he found some good people that, um, I believe, I think it was the guy, he's got a friend here in Phoenix. that's a financial advisor. I believe he was the one who actually found the hospital and one that had ivermectin and would treat him that way instead of putting him on a ventilator, which would have likely killed him. Mm -hmm. And they were able to fly him back and he survived and he's got two beautiful children and you know, great house and he's a happy guy. Awesome. Thank God he had the right people around him. And did he get vaccinated during that time? Do you know? No, I don't believe so. I don't believe he ever did. And afterwards they were pushing him to, to do it. And I was like, dude, you already have the antibodies. You've already been through it. Trust me don't do this. So I I don't know if he did. I I don't believe he did. Mm -hmm. Um, His lungs are pretty badly damaged. You know, he played a lot of basketball before and now he's recovering. It's better, but you know, he'll never, he'll never be the same. But my argument is better to have that than to be dead. I mean, we're seeing some people get one shot and they drop some people. It's two or three boosters and they have, but we're seeing people now dying of heart attacks and strokes at an unprecedented level and people still aren't admitting to it. And I think a lot of people, people are so hard lined. These, these advocates for the vaccines and these like you're killing grandma, those people are so, it was so much of their identity that I don't know if they'll ever be able to admit what they caused, the, the harm that they caused other people by being sheep. Yeah. Yeah. They're just, they're, they're using a, information to gaslight people yeah. on a mass level you hear that phrase mass psychosis yeah uh dr uh desmet uh matthias desmet maybe i don't know yeah, I don't mass recall. formation psychosis or i yeah. think it's just mass formation is his term yeah that's right yeah but they're blaming all of these uh these heart attacks on other things oh yeah just, like open hiking uh they blame coffee at one point they blamed i mean it's crazy too much black tea there's, I mean, it's, it's insane. Yeah. So at this, at this point, if you're watching mainstream stuff and believing it, you're part of the minority, I'm guessing. I would hope. I hope. I hope because the, the lies have been so outlandish and so easily. I mean, you can go back and watch clips from 2020 of all these like MSNBC anchors telling you to get vaccinated to, or in 21, maybe. You know, they're trying to get vaccinated. Oh, it's 100% guaranteed. That you're not going to get COVID and you'll survive it and you won't transmit it. And it's like, Stop we know all this. Spread, is, yeah. Yeah. And it's all lies. I mean, they're offering hamburgers and donuts to people to get vaccinated. And anybody with any common sense knows that this is completely, it was completely new therapy. And sorry, I'm not taking that risk no matter what you say. Yeah. Even my job, giant corporation says uh, they, they they're like okay well if you submit your vaccination status you'll get these incentives like a mug or a bag or convenient or like stupid little crap that doesn't really matter in yeah. comparison to your life and what it might do to you you know the other thing i mean i can understand i i can kind of make an excuse for adults just working a lot of hours not having the time and just going oh well you know i trust my doctor i don't think that way but i could i could understand it 
But the people that took their children in to get stuck in the arm with something without doing any research and then now kids are having myocarditis issues and all these other issues, those parents... They're they're the they're the same parents that are taking their kids to these these drag shows, you know, yeah. the transgender drag shows. They shouldn't have children. They should be. It's child abuse. It's child abuse. Yeah. Yeah. But then that's the. It's a it's that a concerns gene, me more than anything right it's now. It's a gene therapy. It's not even any kind. It's not of a vaccine. Anything. It's not a vaccine. No. And they went and they, they changed the definition of vaccine in the medical dictionary. I yeah. think to no, accommodate this thing. Yeah. But uh, speaking of the drag shows and the kids stuff, you were volunteering or are volunteering at the local high school. Yeah. Correct. How's how's that going and what do you see there as far as the woke stuff? <clears throat> I mean, being in Prescott, I think, I mean, obviously we're going to be in a much better place. There, there are kids there that, I, I don't want to speak too much of it. I don't think it's my place and it's kind of a private issue. And, but just, you know, I, I'm volunteering down there because I'm concerned for the community. I'm you know, I have a child that's going to be growing up here and I don't want to see this, this town turn into what Los Angeles and Washington looks like because they're, it's a nightmare. People are closed minded. They're crazy. They don't think for themselves and it's no place to live. Homelessness is rampant. Drug use is everywhere. And there's people don't have faith there and they laugh at you if, you know, they'll, they'll ridicule you if you say you have faith. It's just a very upside down world. And people come to Prescott and they love Prescott and they're like, oh, I love it, except all these Trumpers and all these religious fanatics. And it's like, and wow. people carrying guns. And I'm like, well, why do you think it's safe? And people are happy. It's like <laughs> the community is safe. People care about each other. And so I wanted to volunteer at the school and just make sure the kids here are like safe. And, and you know, God forbid, uh, like an active shooter scenario or something happens. You know, I have a background in security and, you know, I'm 45, but I'm in reasonably good shape. I can, you know, I, I have experience that could be useful in that situation and the rest of the guys who are volunteering are far better trained and more equipped than i am and most are we have a couple uh special forces guys and we've got just other members of the community that care and the idea is you know to get in there and and just to be positive male role models for for kids to have a presence and to just make sure that things are safe there and that's it and you know we you definitely see the kids that you can tell are struggling there's kids still wearing masks which i find incredibly frustrating um but that starts at home and the parents are the ones who are going to have to you know the the question i have is like how do you how do you communicate to parents that are that fearful and get them to open up their mind to the fact that they're damaging their children you know it, it could be you know not just that the the kid could be doing it on their own because you know no one remembering what my high school experience was like it was not very fun a lot of the time you know kids kids can be really mean to each other yeah so wearing a mask might be just kind of a way to to put yourself into a bubble hmm. and to hide from the uh from ridicule i mean of course it's going to bring on some sort of ridicule because you're still wearing a mask when it's not necessary but it can be kind of a shield in a way but you see the group too it, there's a group that is doing it. You know, it's kind oh. of the little socially awkward, you know, mm -hmm. the kids you can tell they're not athletes and not to say I didn't see anybody picking on them, but you know, everybody has their clicks. I dropped out in eighth grade because I just didn't fit in in school. I hated school. I never felt like I fit in. And so I, I was living in Texas and I was like, I'm not going, you can't make me. I'll <laughs> run away. And so like, all right, get a job on a ranch and do homeschooling. And so I chose to do that. But these kids, you know, it's, again, I think this is about the best community you can have a child in a, in a public school, but it's still concerning. It's still, you know, knowing that the, the college here is extremely liberal and there are some liberal teachers in town and you're seeing a lot of this transgender stuff getting kind of forced on kids in classrooms, um, depending on what news source you're getting because everybody's getting, you know, the algorithm sends you things. And so a lot of my friends in California have no idea that it's becoming as rampant as it is. And they have a hard time believing that teachers are trying to like push transgender issues on kids, but you can see it across the country. I mean, there's videos popping up everywhere now. So yeah. I just, I just want to make sure that that isn't happening here. And if, you know, again, there's only so much you can do, but just being a, trying to present a positive, trying to be a positive role model, just yeah. be around them. That presence, the presence, really big deal. 
yeah, you don't have to say anything. I think if you just live your life the best way possible, you know, you pick up trash on the sidewalk, even if nobody's around, you just do things that you know you should be doing. You know, eventually somebody's going to see it or it's going to carry over. And, and that's, that's the only way to keep your community, I think, safe and moving in the right direction. Do you see any kind of signs of um, the trans stuff being pushed at the high school? No. I mean, yeah. and again, I'm not in the classrooms. That's not, our, our place is more to kind of secure the perimeter to make sure people aren't sneaking on, onto campus if they shouldn't be, because yeah. that is happening. You know, it does happen. And again, with our backgrounds, you know, we're able to come in and find some weak spots and point those out to the security staff there and to the, you know, the people, the admin, and then work with them to help kind of fortify the, you know, the, uh, the campus. Right on. So. Right on. Yeah. You mentioned that you were in uh, security before mm-hmm. doing uh, celebrity protection, right? Yeah. What was that like? Um, it's not glamorous. It's just a lot of travel. And yeah. You're, you're living on somebody else's schedule most of the time. So I kind of went between that. I managed security teams for different nightclubs around Los Angeles down in the Hollywood area. Um, and kind of did that for about 15 years on and off. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you told me one story. I don't know if you can get into the, uh, the name of the biker club that, oh. uh, that you mentioned. You care to share that story? Uh, I'm trying to think of what, where there's like a couple with the same, I can pull it out if the, you don't want the, the name Mongols. in there, but it was the Mongols. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was at an MMA event where they, Ended up stabbing three people right in front of me. Had like a 200 man riot. 200. Uh, I would, I'm estimating. Yeah. But yeah, a huge chunk of the crowd. They were all there for one of their guys fighting, and um, they were throwing trash at the ring because they didn't like one of the official. One of the officials made a, a call and held the action for a second. They started throwing trash, and one person threw a cup back in that direction, and there was a wave of about 200 people that rushed the stage. Whoa. And, yeah. Sheriff's department came in with pepper pepper guns and it was yeah it was crazy That's yeah we, we had a shooting at the club we've had um we had a couple incidences but uh yeah not shot directly at but you know guns out and firing and 10 or 12 of us on like 14 or 16 of them and bottles being thrown and bike rails and stanchions being swung and you know chaos yeah, it sounds like it. Fun and fun in memory and terrifying in the, in the moment. <laughs> not even I, I shouldn't say it. it's not terrifying. I mean, you obviously have an adrenaline pump, but it's so there's so much chaos when those big fights break out that you just kind of go on autopilot and yeah. try to manage the try not to the, get the slashed melee. with something or hit yeah. with a bottle or whatever. Yeah, you're trying to watch hands and you're trying to keep people back and it's hard when <laughs> stay alive. Oh man, it's crazy sometimes, but there's only, you know, there's been a handful of those over the years and that's the nightclub. That's just, and the yeah. nightclubs are getting worse every year. I mean, by the time I left one of the places I was working at, I think I, I just left because they were starting to allow gangbangers in and I was managing the security and we'd had a couple of problems. I was like, I'm out of here. This is bullshit. Hmm. And I think it was about three weeks later, the front door guy got shot in the leg. <laughs> oh, man. All right, I'm done. Yeah. That's a good sign. I think I'm, I think I'm done with this business. Yeah. What'd you move on to after that? Um, I think, I think I went back into celebrity protection. Okay. I uh, got called to work with a big A-list client and it was a good opportunity and didn't really want to go back into it, but I'd been kind of just traveling and trying to do some photography and some things on the side and needed to pay the bills. And so, okay. Photography. Yeah. I've seen some of your photography. It's good stuff. Thanks. Um, with the celebrity protection, did you ever have any incidents where you had to actually engage with a person or is it just kind of, it's mostly preventative. Okay. I mean, we've, I, you know, had one person climb a fence one time at a property, but chased him off, didn't go any further. Yeah. Um, when you're out doing like body coverage on, on a principal, and if you're the only person doing body coverage, it can be kind of crazy when you're out in a public scene. So sometimes you have to, it's rare you really have to put hands on people. That should be the last because people are so sue happy now. You can't really get physical. So a lot of it is just it's having the foresight to see what's coming and, and stop it before it gets there. And so most of it is having the ability to build rapport very quickly with people. Oh, yeah. To 
reason with them and, and get them because when people see celebrities, especially if it's their favorite celebrity, I mean, their you've eyes seen, glaze over, they get, Oh yeah. Start, I start to act crazy. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, I've seen people curl up in the fetal position in tears, sobbing because I was with a client and they were what? like, I swear to you. And it's kind of funny. And all you do is kind of laugh and just step over them and try to like move along before it gets too awkward. But yeah, it, it can be, it's, the Why human they, psyche is, is wild because people build these characters up in their head and they believe they're larger than life. And it's, wow. if you've watched videos of the Beatles or Elvis yeah. back in the day, mm -hmm. that's, I mean, people still, I think, I think with social media, a lot of the celebrity craze is kind of dialed back. Hmm. You don't see the same kind of like manic. I mean, it's still out there, but I just don't, see, I don't think it's quite as intense. It might be wider spread, but it's not as intense, but I've seen moments, you know, I've had, I had a guy, I was working with one, one client and he was a man, sports figure. And we were at a, a bar one night and uh, another guy came up and he was like, just touch my hand, just touch my hand, please. Just, he's begging just to have his hand touched. And I was like, dude. It's like the Jesus story. <laughs> yeah. And I was I'll like, hey, healed. I was like, hey man, take a breath for a second. It's not going to happen. Just relax. Say hi and, you know, have Be a good feet. night. Just, but, but. It's so absurd you can't help but kind of laugh and go like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, you're an adult, man. Let's, yeah, you know. Yeah. That's what happens when you put somebody up on a really high pedestal, I guess. I think it's when you don't have, um, if you're unhappy in your life, if you haven't accomplished things or if you're just insecure and lost, I think it's really easy to fill that void with people that are, you know. It's, it's easy to fall into idol worship when you don't feel like you're special. Yeah. Man, well said. And um, you've done a lot of research, like you were saying before, with the medical stuff with your dad and a little bit with your mom. Mm -hmm. And then um, you told me a, a story about um, something saved your life when you were experimenting on yourself with different oh, supplements. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what what started all that? Why? How did you get into that spot where you were almost going to die? Um, the thing that led me into all the health and nutrition, I always had really, really bad depression. So growing up, just, just always suffered with it. Had a lot of physical ailments, a lot of like really severe stomach aches as a kid. My grandmother was feeding me Coke and hot dogs and TV dinners most of my childhood. And so, you know, I, as a kid, I didn't understand it. I just knew I was sick all the time and I was always in pain and depressed and couldn't figure it out. <clears throat> it wasn't until like my early twenties that I started to see a correlation. I noticed if I drink coffee and I eat something with high sugar, like if I had like a banana and a coffee, I was ready to slip my wrist like an hour later. And so I started going, oh, okay, well, I know when I have this and this, I, I have a really strong reaction. And I noticed dairy was a, a main driver too. If I had more than like two or three ounces of like a heavy cream, just angry and frustrated and depressed and just would spiral out of control. And so that's what led me into learning more about health and diet and started getting into the supplements and I, you know, the thing that led that, that really, that got me to the point that you're, you're referencing, uh, back in the early days of Joe Rogan's podcast, he was pushing the on it, you know, the, the alpha new, brain. Yeah. The neutropic. And his pitch early in the days was like, Hey, this is what, you know, we're telling you what's in it. If you want to make it yourself, make it at home. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll just make it myself because it was too expensive. You know, I was kind of like on a budget at that time. I'm like, I'm not paying whatever it was, 50, 60 bucks for it. But I'll try to make it. So I bought the individual constituents and started putting it together and started experimenting with different amounts. And in that process, not with the nootropic specifically, but with other minerals and different herbs end up giving myself serotonin syndrome at one point. And that's, I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah. That's what it was. Serotonin yeah. syndrome. I can remember how you got to that point. Yeah. So how long, how long did you, or when did you realize that that's what it was? Um, the first day it, it felt like a flu, but it didn't, you know, like you said with COVID, like I knew something, I knew it wasn't the flu, but it wasn't, you know, it was just different. It was similar. Um, I was in, I was training a ton at that time. And I mean, best shape of my life. I mean, I was like peak physical condition felt great with the nootropics. I was even at like a higher level. I mean, I really felt like I was, I, you know, definitely in a peak, peak physical state. Um, I had worked out with a buddy at the house and we went to go get some in and out afterwards. And I had just taken 
like some supplements before I left the house. We went to get food and we came back. I'm like, ah, I just feel a little off. I'm like, why do I feel off? I'm like, I've never felt this healthy. I've never felt this good. What did I eat? What? Because at that point, I realized how sensitive I am to certain things. I started kind of like looking at it. And I was like, well, I just started taking this stuff called rhodiola rosea, which is um, just an herb. I didn't, I wasn't aware of it at the time, but it's a mild MAOI. So it's a mono, monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And monoamine oxidase is the enzyme that breaks down um, different amino acids. So... And it, and it causes the cascade from like serotonin into, was it uh, 5-HTP into serotonin, which is 5-HT into melatonin. And so just knew something was off. Didn't feel well that night. It kept, kept getting worse and worse. Tried to eat a little bit the next day. And I noticed, it's, it, I think I ate a little bit that night and felt sicker. And it correlated with the meal. And I was like, ah, oh, it's weird that I would feel worse after eating. And the next morning I ate some food and got worse. And was trying to put it together. I'm like, okay, it must be something I took. And so I didn't really have that figured out until like maybe day two or three when I started getting really, really ill. I was having my lungs fill up with fluid at night. I couldn't sleep. I was getting um, some neuropathy. So my fingertips were getting like pins and needles. Um, and I mean, when I say I couldn't sleep, like couldn't sleep at all. So I would just lay in bed and cough and hack. And um, it was just really uncomfortable. Massive migraine headache really hard time like seeing and I was trying to teach martial arts at the same time so I was super sick I would go run a class I, I like I said I knew it wasn't the flu I didn't feel like I was contagious I was just like but something is making me sick and so by day two or three I was like I started looking through everything and I was like oh I think this starts this is lining up with serotonin syndrome and um I think by day three or four I was like getting pretty bad and I was starting to get desperate and I was looking around for a drug called cyproheptadine which is what they use in like a clinical setting for it um I called my ex-girlfriend who had worked in the pharmaceutical industry and I knew she was working with neurologists and I was like hey 90% sure I have this thing called serotonin syndrome I'm trying to get a hold of cyproheptadine are there any other options because it, you know I'd rather not do this but I'm kind of stuck and looking for information. And she went and she, she's like, let me talk to a doctor. So she happened to be friends with a guy who was a leading neurologist. Convenient. Convenient. <laughs> this is 2010-ish, 2012 maybe, maybe 2012, hmm. many years before my dad and this whole thing. So this was kind of my first foray into understanding this better because of my experience of this whole thing. And so the neurologist comes back to her and says, sounds like you're – ex-boyfriend is on Google a little too much, tell him to go to the hospital and quit trying to figure it out himself. And so me being stubborn, I was like, tell him to go fuck himself. There's <laughs> no way possible. I'll die before I go to a hospital now. Fuck him. I'll figure this out. Yeah. Sorry about the language. Oh, you're good, man. Okay. Um, and so I dug my heels in and I just kept getting sicker. And it got to the point where I was having like, I would be walking and black out for four or five steps Still not sleeping at all. Whoa. I was coughing up. I was filling a 32 ounce cup full of fluid for my lungs every night. Whoa. I was like literally drowning from just couldn't clear the, the mucus and the fluid. And I was having waking by and it's still teaching martial arts. So I was driving an hour in traffic and teach a Krav Maga class because the, the head instructor was, I think, in Israel at the time. And so I was filling in for him and running the class. So I was a mess. And so I think it was by like day six, I went to my roommate, Brent, who you've, I think you met briefly. He was at the, the wedding. Oh, yeah. Okay, Brent. He was in the, the main house. I was in the back room. And I went in and I was like, dude, I think I'm dying. I need you to take me to the emergency room right now. Because I was, I was in the shower and I didn't know where I was. I had no idea where I was at. Didn't know what was going on. I just felt this overwhelming like anxiety. <clears throat> oh, man. And he's like, okay, let's go. And I'm like, oh no, I've got to teach the Krav class. Let me, let me go teach class. When I come back, I might have you take me. <laughs> so talk class got back and I, I just had it set. I was like, I'm going to figure this out tonight. I got to figure this out. I, I knew that the next step after like getting the, the neuropathy and all these other things that were kind of building up, I knew the next step was kind of coma and then you're done. So I'm like, okay, I've, I'm giving it one more day. St couldn't sleep, so I was just reading all night, and I found some obscure paper about copper 
and monoamine oxidase, and it was from the University of Washington, some paper, and I just stumbled across it. And then I started doing the math, and I was like, oh my God, I was taking all this zinc. I was taking like 50 milligrams of zinc a day, and I don't have any copper in the house, so we had old uh, galvanized pipes, and started doing the math. I'm like, okay, I was getting too much zinc. I was blocking my copper absorption. I took a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Okay, maybe it's copper. I was like, this is my Hail Mary to see if this is what it was. And so... I crawled the, the, the block. I had, I had one block walk to GNC. So in the morning, as soon as it opened, I crawled my ass down there and bought 2,000 micrograms of copper. And I'm like, okay, I'll break it in half because I don't want to throw my system off anymore. If I'm wrong, I'm going to go to the hospital and they're going to pump me full of stuff and put, you know, I'm going to have a $30,000 hospital visit because I'm not going to survive. It's amazing you had that thought in that state of being. Uh, I mean, I was, I was a mess, but I was trying to walk my th- myself through like what options were. Mm-hmm. But the copper was the only thing I could figure out. I tried everything else. I couldn't eat. So I couldn't eat for the six days either because anything I ate, I believe was causing more of a serotonin feedback loop. And so the two things I found that I could eat without making my symptoms worse, I could eat a, a bite of sweet potato and two or three blueberries. Mm-hmm. And that was all I could tolerate. And so that was, I would eat that a couple times a day. So no calories. I'd lost 20 something pounds at this point by day six. Holy crap. So I was like 192 pounds, I think. Wow. And like frail. Um, but I took this copper, got home, cracked in half, put it under my tongue. 20 minutes later, headache lifted. Felt like a release in my ears. I could hear like almost like a whistle, like all the pressure in my head went out. And that night I was able to eat again and start like within, again, eight or 10 hours. It was like instant and things started resolving from, from being copper deficient. That's amazing. So do you know now what copper does in the body or the, or what the lack of copper, how it would contribute to those symptoms? Um, I mean, it's just a key, it's, it's just a key component of the enzyme of creating enzymes, creating enzymes. Okay. So I just started playing with a, a peptide. That's my new, again, like another direction I'm moving in right now, just trying to understand them. I started playing with the GHK CU, which is a copper containing peptide and it's used for collagen and skin, you know, um, skin repair. Uh, but it does actually turns on an awful lot of genes, turns off a lot of cancer genes and turns on some other, um, more restorative, um, healing. Right genes. On. Yeah. So my, my understanding is very limited. I've just done quite a bit of reading on like more on people experimenting with themselves and what they're, you know, what they've been posting. Yeah. So, Right on. Key component. So it's it's very important. And if you're not aware of your minerals, I think a lot of people are really sick because they one, they eat like crap. And so they're they're not getting adequate minerals that way because most of our food sources are horribly corrupted. And so if you're not getting good grass fed meat and uh you know, going out of your way to eat healthy, you're you're probably in a deficit and probably causing some really Yeah. Some big problems down the line. Yeah, let's talk carnivore. Okay. So I'm partway through the book, The Carnivore Code by Paul Saladino. Cool. And he's saying a lot of stuff that's really kind of blowing my mind. And, you know, a little bit of it's made me think, okay, well, it almost sounds like everything is bad. uh, And I don't want to believe that because of, you know, all of these beliefs I've built up over time about what's healthy and what's not. He's kind of taken all that stuff and thrown it to the wayside and presenting a whole new perspective on what is and what isn't healthy and why. Mm -hmm. One thing that I really like that he's doing in this book is he's saying like, all right, well, here's this vegetable and here's what's healthy about it. Mm -hmm. And he says that. And then all the stuff that supports that health doesn't ever talk about, well, what might not be healthy about it too? So he goes into both sides of it. He shows this is what's healthy about it, but this is also what it's doing in your body, which is really bad. Talking about the lectins and the The lectins and the uh, uh, oxalates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all that kind of stuff. So I looked at a chart, a little PDF chart that comes with the audio book, and it's showing on the left there's these uh, uh, least or less toxic, and then on the right it's most toxic Mm -hmm. in the vegetables and the fruits. So like the sweetest fruits are in the... um, uh, closer to more toxic and then berries are like right in the middle and then avocados are the less toxic, but then you have, um, the nightshades and the lectin and stuff. And so it's, it's like all these little needles that are basically on a microscopic level, tearing up your, your intestines. Is that, 
what your understanding is? I couldn't tell you at okay. that level. Yeah. Um, I started reading about the lectins and stuff in my early twenties and my first, like when I first started getting interested in the zone diet, that's what kind of led me into learning more about the diet stuff. Um, but yeah, the lectins are the problematic issue with, with most vegetables yeah. and depending on how much gut permeability you have, you know, some people aren't reactive. Some people do pretty well in vegetarian or vegan diets for many years, but then eventually down the line you run into um, a lot of deficiencies, especially with the brain and, and other, um, you know, parts of your body. Uh, you know, that are rec- you really need fats and you, you know, if you're not supplementing with B vitamins, you're going to end up in, with problems. Everybody's different. Um, yeah. I do very, very poorly on carbohydrates. It causes depression and causes inflammation. Mm-hmm. The carnivore diet has been the best diet bar none. Um, for myself, adherence is the hardest part. Yeah. As you know, it's, you know, it's a rebound effect when you get done. You're just like, oh, I just want to eat whatever. Yep. Um, I think the intelligent way to approach it is stay carnivore based as much as possible. Really try to stay away from the high glycemic, you know, dopamine hitting fruits and candy, anything that's really going to cause that addictive. Because after, after a month to six weeks, you kind of get those cravings out of your system. If you allow them back in, you're going to start having that problem again. So you just have to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. And I think things like winter squash and certain low glycemic fruits are good. Um, You know, the theory of honey with certain fruits along with meat as kind of a staple is probably good. You just have to find the fruits that work for you. Blueberries typically for me cause a little bit of depression if I have too many, which is weird. I don't know anybody else like that, but I Mm -hmm. found that to be, I'm a little sensitive to blueberries. Um, as I'm getting older, I notice the more carbohydrates I eat, the more body fat stores, it's just harder to get rid of. So the yeah. more I lean towards carnivore, the better off I am. So in when, that regard. so when you do carnivore, I've heard that carnivore is more to be used as like a reset <laughs> for the body rather than a lifestyle. So you're talking animal based. What, what's your approach at that? Do you have like a percentage of 80% meat, 20% everything else, something like that? For me personally, like I, I got my brother on this diet when he was having problems. He was he had to medically retire from the sheriff's department because of back issues. And they wanted to fuse his back and basically, you know, again, surgery first before looking at anything else. And I asked him to try the carnivore diet for a month and it resolved most of the issues. And it, and it got him to a place where he was comfortable enough where he didn't have to have the surgery. He still had to retire, but, um, but it, it, removed enough inflammation to where he was like functional again. Hmm. So what, what I tell everybody is if they're going to go into it, minimum four weeks, just red meat, just to keep, just to get your system cleared and clean to know exactly where you're at. I always recommend, so four weeks of red meat, and that's primarily steaks and some ground beef. Mm-hmm. And I would stay away from, I mean, you could have a little bit of lamb. Um, I would stay away from all pork. And I would even limit fish just to just to get that four week mark, and then once you're at the four week mark, and and I'm sorry, sea salt. You need adequate sea salt. So, depending on the person, somewhere from six to twelve grams of sea salt a day. If I'm training, I go up to fifteen grams a day, which seems high, but if you're not hypertensive, then you don't really have to worry about it. And it's it's really important if you have low, too low a sodium. There's actually a higher increase of all cause mortality in groups that have low lower sodium so it's really a key thing to have so electrolytes are really important yeah so that, that's what i was going to ask what all does the sea salt do for the body because it's got it's just a it's a it's just an essential it's an, an electrolyte so you have to have it to, to maintain blood volume to maintain a healthy blood pressure i it's going to do a bunch of other things that i couldn't tell you off the top of my head right now mm-hmm. but it's critical to have and the same way potassium magnesium you know the rest of your electrolytes and so after, once you start transitioning back onto foods, I start supplementing with more like, um, I really like Element, Rob Wolf's company. They have a, an electrolyte. It's uh, L-M-N-T is the spelling on it. They make great electrolytes for putting in your water. So when you're training on carnivore, it's really good to have that with additional sea salt. Um, but yeah, so four weeks on, and then each week, what I recommend is adding one fruit or vegetable, a low glycemic fruit or vegetable into your diet. And reason being, each week you're going to see what the reaction is. So, 
Week one, if you want to make a blueberries, add some blueberries. If you start getting brain fog, you feel lethargic, you have inflammation in your knees, any, anything out of the norm, because by the time you're on carnivore for four weeks, you usually feel pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. Your mental clarity is like peaked. Inflammation is generally gone from your body. Um, and so you'll be pretty sensitized to anything that comes in. So blueberries cause it, well, blueberries are out. And the next thing you move on to like maybe apricots because they're high in potassium. They store well for like, you know, drying apricots. That's a favorite of mine. Um, but eventually work into like maybe even like oats if you want to try oats, whatever it is, but one component a week. Mm -hmm. If something adds inflammation, take it out and you can build your diet back that way. Right and on. then just be aware of your minerals. Cool. Good. There's a, um, a pastor I like who says something. He says, more fathers and less government. And we've talked about stuff like that a little bit, about the, the role of the healthy man in today's society and how it's kind of lacking. You get all this stuff about toxic masculinity going around. And I think that's a really important subject to touch on. Um, so obviously you and I have the mental clarity to be able to tell what is toxic masculinity and what is, you know, people trying to be divisive. Mm -hmm. So how would you paint a healthy masculine role in today's society, including all the trans stuff that's going on, including all of this division that's happening. What does a healthy man do in the face of all of this? The only thing I've come up with after driving myself crazy, trying to come up with the answers like you, um, it has to start with your family first. So it starts in the house. I think you have to have a, a foundation, your relationship with God first and foremost, your relationship with your wife, and being a strong partner, not being wishy-washy, leading from the front. You have to be a role model for your child, and you have to grow it out from there. So the, you have to surround yourself. You're the sum of the five people you surround yourself with. Or I've heard that said. Mm -hmm. And so you want other strong male role models. Mm -hmm. And I think to quantify that is to say you don't want people that are acting out of ego. You know, we all go in the gym and we lift and we can get crazy in there and have fun. But the guys that puff out their chest or talk about it or the same bully mentality, like that's unhealthy. That's not, that's not masculinity. That's weakness. Yeah. And so humility, you know, again, it's great to feel pride in what you do, but always to bring yourself back to a place of humility. You know, I'm accomplishing a lot of goals this year in the gym and I'm hitting numbers I never thought I would hit in my life. Yeah. And I leave the gym sometimes so high on endorphins that I'm, I kind of almost feel like cocky. And I really honestly try every time just to be like, Hey, chill out. <laughs> you, you just push to wait, relax. Yeah. It's not that big a deal. So I think humility is really important. I think empathy is very important. Yeah, that's a big one. That's kind of lacking in men. Yeah. And most men today, well, I guess I don't know most men today, but from what I see on the, the social media and the world stage is that a lot of men, or it's not promoted for men to be empathetic toward other people. The care and the compassion is not, you know, the, at the tip of the spear, really. Well, you know? everything's divisive now. Yeah. And so it doesn't serve the media companies and BlackRock and whoever else is trying to divide our country the way they're dividing it. It doesn't make, they don't want people empathetic. They want people angry. And so you're either an unhealthy, trans-hating, white, male, you know, Trump, whatever they want to put on you, or you're, you know, an insane trans leftist, you know, whatever they can do to divide. Yeah. But yes, but, but empathy should be like one of the primary traits of, of every human being. Um, yeah. Again, going back to Brent, you know, he's been a martial artist his whole life and he, he, you know, he quotes Musashi a lot and that there's a lot in kind of like the samurai codes that were really beautiful being the art. It's the yin and the yang, right? So you should be a, 
a capable, deadly warrior, and you should also be artistic and empathetic, and, and you should be able to operate in both worlds equally. Yeah. And so I think that's what masculinity really looks like. You should have a healthy body, first of all. You can't sit on the couch and play video games and consider yourself a healthy male. Sorry, but you have to be active. Mm-hmm. Even though we don't have the same physical struggles at this point in the world, we might be coming back into that. And it's important if you don't have a strong body, I think it creates a weak ego and a lot of people that don't train hard and maybe don't do martial arts. They don't learn. They don't learn that confidence. And so it's a lot of, um, would bloviating be the right word? <laughs> There's a lot of, um, like ego and a lot of false puffing up. Yeah. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. What are your thoughts? What do you, what do you see as, I think all that's all that is right on point, especially the being able to operate in both arenas equally. Hmm. It's balance. It's being, being a balanced man. So the, um, the part of the man that has been kind of left to the wayside in our generation or the previous couple is, is the empathy and the compassion, which is one reason looking to Jesus is such a, a big deal for men is to find a compassionate, kind, caring, man who's also extremely capable of violence is like few and far between and um, not here i feel like this community that we're in is like it's exceptional in that way there's there's a much higher percentage here than any place i've ever been it's a gem it it really is a, a treasure this place and that's why it's so important to feed the the healthy masculine because without the healthy masculine it's it's gonna fall everything's gonna fall apart like that old saying you know the the soft men makes hard, hard times. times yeah. And, uh, and right now we see a lot of like the, I don't know, the, the new age type of culture. It's like, okay, well you can be balanced, but you want to be inclusive and tolerant and stuff like that, which yeah, I get where you're going with that. But at the same time, how, how much does that soften your resolve? And um, you have to have a moral foundation you have to have a, your moral compass has to be set in stone and you can't, you can love people and you can tolerate people and it doesn't mean you have to agree with what they're doing at mm-hmm. all. And I'm not saying that you persecute them or make them feel lesser for any reason. I think it's every person's responsibility to try to better the world and try to project what they believe to be the correct way to live and that comes through strength and that comes through humility and that comes through empathy um but you can't fold you can't be overly sensitive and you can't it's the same thing with the parents that are afraid to say no to their children because they want to be their friend and it hurts them to hurt their children it's like if you're not willing to be strong for your children and, and not willing to set hard lines and to be the bad guy then you're not being a parent and you're ruining your ruining your child. And a lot, that was a lot of the issues I had growing up is I had a grandmother who couldn't tell me no to anything. And I had no rules, no guidelines. And I was lost and had very low self-esteem and I never achieved anything because of that was a huge hurdle to get through because she wanted to be my friend mm. and, um, weak parenting causes those hard times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, when it comes to a, what, what a healthy masculine is, oftentimes I just try and come back to like character traits and so I, I think like being assertive is a huge one, mm-hmm. um, because a, a healthy man is assertive and an unhealthy man is very clearly passive or weak or yeah. And then, um, and then same thing with unhealthy is compulsive men, people who act mm-hmm. out of compulsion are, are unhealthy and, and even dangerous because they can't be trusted in, in, in a dangerous time or in a time where where a man is needed to stand up and courage or, or something like that, or get between an evil person and women and children like that. Um, the, uh, the incident with the park, the, in, I think it was in France where there was a guy, some, some guy went into a park and just well, with a knife, with a knife and just yep. started trying to stab women and children. And then some, some guy got between them and, and was swinging at him with his backpack. And I didn't see that part. And, um, and uh, it t- turns out he was able to run him out of the park. And he like, he was a Christian guy, I guess. And he rebuked him in Jesus' name and ran him out of the park. Oh, wow. Which I, yeah, I just found that out uh, a little bit recently. So funny the press didn't put that in the. Yeah, of course. Right? No, they're not going to say that part. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but uh, another healthy uh, element for a man is to be decisive. Yes. Because if you're being ambiguous, you don't know what decision to make, then that's going to wreak havoc on everyone around you. you to be a leader, I th- I you think have to be decisive. A, I think a big problem with children that are raised by mothers, and not, I'm not knocking some, I mean, I can't imagine how difficult it is to raise a child, but that's a very female trait to be indecisive about things. And I see a lot of kids that have just mothers around lacking that Mm -hmm. ability to be decisive. Yeah. It's It's not across the board. I'm speaking very generally, but right. Right. But in a situation like that, it's like, well, there's something lacking Mm -hmm. that's making this fully healthy and balanced. Kind of like your copper. If your copper's not there, it's an, it's a missing element that's causing problems. Yeah. The same thing with a healthy male role model in a kid's life or, or even a husband of a, of a household or, or whatever it may be. The healthy man, you can't ch- trade that for, for tolerance and diversity and equity and inclusion. It's not... You well, can't. if you understand why they're doing this, right? Uh, so they're trying to destroy the nuclear family. Yeah. They're moving the man from the household yeah. through, um, you know, whether you want to call it feminism or whatever it is, by removing the man, you now have a child that's going to become more of the States, you know, they're, they're easy to, easier to manipulate. They don't have the same foundational, um, maybe traits that you would get from having a strong male yeah. figure. And, and they don't want that. The government wants people that are compliant and don't think on their own and are weak. Well, and, it's like a castle. Why did they build castles the way they did to defend from enemies? So they've got this giant brick wall. Yeah. If you remove the giant brick wall and there's just vulnerability and anything can be taken or taken advantage of. Mm-hmm. And that's what the man is. is he's the brick wall. That's a great metaphor. That's um, yeah, the other one I have here is <laughs> I really like this one because it, because it's controversial, but it's totally true. Is the capacity for extreme violence? Yes. And I think uh, a healthy man is like Jordan Peterson actually says this is a dangerous man. It's like you Absolutely. have, and it, you know, because warriors didn't come from nowhere. Warriors get to be to the heights that they are not because they're weak, but because they're strong and because they have a big heart and they, they want to protect. Mm -hmm. It's the, the protective element that's massive. I think something that's been, um, an issue with self-defense, especially we've, we've, and don't get me wrong. We've been raised to be honorable and which is a very important component of being a good human being. You should be honorable. But in cases of extreme violence, and I was meeting with a guy yesterday, we're starting to work on developing a curriculum for self-defense. And this, I don't, I don't have um, very much experience at all when it comes to like bladed weapons and different things, and that's his forte. And when you talk to somebody who's a knife specialist, man, it is eye-opening. Um, and we were discussing it. And while you have to be honorable, you also have to understand that when there's conflicts, you have to be absolutely ruthless in your execution of violence if necessary. So if you're with your wife and child and somebody comes up to rob you or they're attacking you, once the violence, once, once that threshold is broken, if you can't, if you're not able to, um, you know, build rapport with the guy and, and diffuse the situation, if it goes to that violent, you have to be willing to act with absolute violence until the threat stopped. And I think most people aren't mentally, I don't, I don't think people understand that concept. You know, it's like people are taught you can't, you don't kick each other in the nuts, you know, eye gouge, you know, MMA has very specific rules and a lot of people that train jujitsu and it's like, Oh, I'm doing self-defense. It's great. It's very practical. But if you go to double leg a guy and he's got a knife and he sticks you in the ribs a bunch of times while you're getting a takedown or cuts your throat, your life's over. And so I think part of the, the masculinity is also having that switch where it's like, if it's life or death, you know, I'm not, I'm not just going to be honorable and like defend myself. I'm going to end right. this. Yeah. I'm going to end this as quickly as I possibly can. I mean, I'm not trying to kill people, but obviously, but you have to be willing to be violent yeah. to protect other people sometimes. And it's a, it's a sad fact of this world. Yeah. So we'll shred that concept, that phrase mm-hmm. of fighting like a man. Yeah. Fight like a man. Stand up and fight me like a man. Exactly. Well, fighting like a man is, is winning, winning yeah. and destroying your enemy. 
whether you got to kick them in the nuts or not. Now, if you're an aggressor, I don't have any sympathy for you unless there's some reason, you know, you're protecting, you know. Well, the sympathy doesn't override the situation, though. That's there may it. be good reason for their actions, but it doesn't. If it's override. in self-defense, I'm sorry, but if you're an aggressor and it's in self-defense, you have come into whatever's coming to you. If you're especially robbing somebody with a weapon, if I'm on that jury, you're, you know, the guy defending himself is going to walk 100 percent of the time. Sorry, yeah, but good people have to be able to defend themselves. Yeah, and that's that's why being <clears throat> decisive is so important because you can't half ass it you can't start defending yourself and then be like oh i don't want to i don't want to hurt this person oh i hope he doesn't sue me yeah oh and then you get hit in the back of the head by his buddy that you weren't (laughs) watching yeah but it's yeah so sorry i didn't mean to run off on a tangent on the violence but oh no we were just talking about that and it's an important important aspect you know no we're just playing tennis here cool so um I keep coming back to that being one of the most important things that we can have today during all of this uh, attempt at division and this like psychological castration of men and this like um, just trying to take away from what is a man and what is a healthy man. And and it's like, oh, well, you're you're this you're this color, you're this whatever, put it put a man in whatever box you want to. And it's trying to create division and, and separation and, like you said, anger. But really the way to combat that is to live, lead by example and to be that healthy man and to express more clear, balanced ideas that override and overrule those ones that are dividing and divisive. And people that care will have the ears to hear it. Whether they're listening for it or not, it'll hit them in the right way if if they actually care about what's happening. So the scary part is that there's a lot of a lot of people that don't, it seems. I think the again, the the focus on compassion and inclusivity and all these things that are great in theory. Um they just don't work in the real world and they're causing, they're, they're causing the destruction of this, of this country. Yeah. And they're taking good people. And most people that would consider themselves a Democrat or a liberal view themselves that way because they're compassionate and they're empathetic and they have good qualities, but they're being manipulated by these people. The thing I get from friends that I have, that are still very liberal. I don't talk to them a lot anymore because it's frustrating because, you know, there's a disconnect. Not that I, hate them by any means just we just are different on different pages but their view of anybody if they hear the word conservative they immediately something about trump comes out of their mouth and there's this like they view conservatives speaking broadly again but most people that that are on the left now view conservatives as trump loving gun-toting violent corporatist you know like all these like really negative things the same way a lot of the conservatives would see anybody liberal as blue-haired tranny whatever 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 terms you want to put on it things have been polarized so hard now yeah um that nobody can really communicate and so these people that are on the left that have all this compassion they're being manipulated and they're twisting this compassion and this inclusivity and this you know, they believe that people are all these trans people are getting murdered and it's just not true. You know? Yeah. And if you even give them statistics and you say, look, did you see the thing they did on uh, how many black people are killed every year by police? I heard something briefly. Yeah. So they were asking people on the street. They were finally like Democrats in the street. And they're like, how many black people are killed annually? One answer was 30 percent of black people every year are killed by police. Another person said uh, somewhere around like 30,000 a year. And the real number is like somewhere between six and 12 like people, six, six people, six people, not 600 people, no. not 6,000, no, people. six to 12, six to 12 black people. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of the, the stuff in the media, it was the same with the COVID vaccines. It's all this propaganda. And, and the problem is, is people aren't really trying to get to the, They're reacting emotionally and yeah. empathetic people are typically emotional. And so they prey on these emotions. And then now we have this divide where nobody's talking and it's going, 
back into the spiritual element of all of this, it's taking that compassion and, and weaponizing it and twisting yes. those people and manipulating them against people who they, you know, generally would care about. Yeah. And really now they're starting to hate people who also have compassion, but have boundaries and standards and don't let the compassion overrule other elements of yeah. being a healthy person. Well, do you remember when the Democratic Party was typically, or liberals were typically the anti-war party? Yeah. And now they're pushing war more than, and that's just by an emotional tweak on on the party mm-hmm. and by creating the right propaganda. And it's it's baffling to me to see how we're all in this country. We we're all we all have the same desires. We all want to be happy. We want to have our family and loved ones happy and healthy and successful. And I don't think anybody really wants anybody to suffer. But yet, we're so divided. The real enemy is the politicians, the government, all these, you know. Traitors to our country and traitors to the people. Absolutely. Yeah, and I've got a guy I'll I'll introduce you to. You should have a good conversation about Marxism, where it comes from. And I talked to him a lot yesterday. And even getting into World War II and the Nazi Party and how, you know, we think we defeated them. And they scattered all over the world, like running and hiding. And his angle was they didn't really run and hide. They really spread out to create... Fourth Reich. Exactly. The Fourth Reich. And so they've got communities and bases established all over the world. Now, the bases might be, you know, they're not like operating bases anymore, but they're, they're, they're communities that speak German in South America. And yeah. they're still very Nazi based. And people don't realize that that ideology came over with the Operation Paperclip and a lot of these people that were brought to the United States after World War II. And That's right. Yeah. Those uh, Nazi scientists. Yeah. Yeah. Are you uh, familiar with the show Hunting Hitler with yeah. Tim Kennedy? It's great. Oh man, I just I started watching that show and fell in love with it. It was just it blew my mind. All of the stuff that's left out of the main story. It's crazy, isn't it? It, it is crazy and it's scary and it's you know. And there's still so much that I don't even know. I'm just like I said. I love talking to people that are well read on the subject because you know you. I think everybody kind of has like a you get information kind of like a transient sort of, okay, they were the bad guys, really good guys. This war happened. Hitler was killed. He was the guy. And really there's people behind the scenes, much like what's happening with Biden now, who's obviously a puppet. We have all these people who are just puppets, people pulling the strings are the ones who are going to continue to succeed, whether or not Biden gets thrown into the fire for all this treason, which is the only reasonable um, title I think you can put on what he's done to this country. Yeah. Um, well, the the thing that makes my blood kind of boil is when people start to blame Joe Biden, like he's the one that's he's the guy. making these choices. He's yeah, he's the guy. He's, he's the just problem. He's a corrupt asshole that yeah, it's you know, not, they can puppet. Dude probably doesn't even know what he's doing. No. Did you watch the Fetterman Biden speech yesterday? Oh no, I didn't. Not yet. But Fantastic. I did see the thing. Is that when he said the thing about the pistol brace changing the caliber of a gun? No, that was, I think that was another stupid thing. You, you mean, saw that though. Oh, amazing. <laughs> For people wow. that don't shoot, by putting a brace and a pistol, it doesn't change the caliber, just so you guys know. Yeah. A lot does. of the stuff that's being promoted in the media about guns and gun safety and all these things that need to take guns away, it's it's so nonsensical that it's... It's laughable, really. It's laughable. The information is false. It's a straight-up lie. Lies. And it's, yeah. fa- it's it's laughable. But, but, I mean, if a pistol brace did change the caliber of a gun man i'd have all kinds of pistol braces awesome. change my calibers all the time but how does that make it more dangerous it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't what's, the, what's dangerous is not having the second amendment to be able to defend from the government that we created that's now taking advantage of us so i'm gonna open a door into a topic that i, I, I this is gonna be good because i've heard that you're not a big fan of rfk because yeah. because of the second amendment concerns with him yeah I had the same concerns and I saw a statement from him and I don't know where he lies exactly on it. Now I need to go do some more reading and look at some interviews and see where he's at specifically. But the one statement I did see recently, it looks like his perception has changed and I don't think he sees it as, as a gun problem, as a mental health and pharmaceutical issue. Because if you look at every single one of these shooters, they are all on pharmaceutical drugs. Yeah. As far as I know, a hundred percent, and if it's not 100%, it's got to be 98, 99% yeah. of all mass shooters have been on some sort of psychotropic drug mm. so or hormones. The yeah. last girl that was trans 
I think we've just had four or five shooters that have all been trans that they're not actually the, talking about them being trans. The as well. one at the Christian school yeah. who has a gender dysmorphic disorder. Dysphoria. Yeah. And, and yeah. was on tons of male hormones. And yeah. when you give young girls tons of male hormones, things are going to go wrong. Yeah. I feel bad for so, those kids. But it's not the gun. It's the gun is the tool. And yeah. the point I would like to make to people that are so fearful of guns and they see guns as the problem the gun is the tool and the problem is mental health. And we have a mental health crisis in this country. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, the pharmaceutical com- companies are pushing drugs on children, which they shouldn't do. The gender dim- dysmorphia is causing a major problem with the children. They're putting, being put on drugs, which are causing these problems. If they don't get access to a gun, they have access to cars. Knives. Knives. Baseball bats. I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you could pull this up, but I believe hammers are used in more fatalities every year than firearms, statistically. Let's pull it up. I really hope I'm not wrong about this, but I heard that the other day. and The idea being the tool, a tool is a tool, and the person wielding the tool, right? Because you're not going to take cars away from people. I mean, they're trying... believe they will eventually they're going to try yeah but people are going to make bombs they're going to make whatever they can into a weapon and a gun is just just another tool for it there we go june 2nd of this year number of murder victims in the united states in 2021 by weapons used let's see if they have hammers on here blunt blunt objects 243 okay. And what I heard was incorrect because that is 243 and the number of handgun deaths is 6,012. But well, with, the, with the handgun deaths, is that homicides or suicides? Because that's a huge... So that's the thing is that they don't differentiate. They say the they problem. say murder or they say um, gun violence. A homicide, or excuse me, a suicide by gun is it's included gun in violence. the statistics for gun violence, which is misleading. Mm-hmm. I think veterans are killing themselves, what, every 12 minutes or 20 minutes, something like that? Yeah, 22 a day, something, whatever that. 22, a, okay. So changes to. 22 a day. So if you're factoring all of those suicides into, the 6, you know, 000. gun violence, then it's going to be, it's very skewed numbers. And this is the first link that pulled up on on a, Statista. a, sur- a search. So I don't know who this statistics company is or if they're paid or, you know, Again, that's the problem now with the deep fakes with websites. Yeah. Again, I, I hear things quoted, which is why it's good to like double check because yeah, it's good to have that. It's it's hard though because you you're trying to sift through information to find what's correct. FBI data shows more deaths by hands, fists, and feet than rifles. Oh, you should outlaw those. I know. Cut them off. Cut them off. <laughs> so going back to the nightclubs, yeah. uh, a guy got sucker punched outside of our club one night, fell, hit his head, and died. And that's just how it goes. So, there we go. It's a, it's a tool. FBI crime statistics show that 662 homicides in 2020 were committed with personal weapons described as hands, fists, and feet. The statistics also show that 455 homicides were committed by rifles. And there were 13,000 something homicides committed with guns, including 4,000. Where the type of the firearm was not specified. That doesn't really matter. But the So it, what's important to also look at the 455 homicides by rifles. Rifles are also ARs. Mm-hmm. They are not assault rifles. It's, they, they, they're calling them weapons of war. A rifle is a rifle. It looks scary because it's a tactical rifle. looks different than a hunting rifle. Well, yeah, you, a rifle is a rifle. You associate most most people mm-hmm. that would weigh in or vote on this type of an issue are basing all their stuff off of Black Hawk Down and these movies. Yeah, they don't have any. You know, you, it's like the Mike Tyson quote where he says, "Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face." Mm-hmm. And it's like you don't know you need a gun until you're in the situation where somebody's dead next to you and you need a gun. Well, I mean, let's say we remove all the guns. From the country, right? Yeah. So, six hundred million guns get turned in. Good luck. Okay. Well, what happens to the eighty-year-old woman that's shopping at the store and is confronted by three thugs and robbed and raped on the way out to her car? Tough luck. 
that's not very fair, right? No. So the gun is the equalizer. And I think if people understood that the gun equals the playing field for weaker people, I think all these people that are compassionate and care about human beings would want people to be trained. And mm-hmm. I think I told you the other day at Costco, I helped a lady carry her groceries out to her car. She popped the trunk. She had to be well into her seventies or eighties. I mean, she was very old and in her trunk was a bunch of targets and her pistol case and everything else. And she competes in pistol. And it's like, God bless that woman. You know, yeah. she's not, she's, she's less likely to be a victim. Yeah. Criminals will always find weapons. Criminals travel in packs. Criminals will always have guns. And can, most of the time, criminals take advantage of people who are in vulnerable positions or distracted or whatever. Criminals pick the easiest target. And the yeah. reason why that the the shooter, the, the, the transgender shooter shot up the Christian school, she had multiple targets in her manifesto and she chose the one that was the easiest target. And that's typically how it works. People look for victims. And if you walk around looking on your phone, you can go on Instagram and watch multiple people getting robbed at gas stations. Because a guy in his flip-flops is standing next to his Tesla looking at his cell phone while three guys walk up and rob him from behind and take his car and just, you know, beat him up and leave. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, tools. Yeah. Well, ultimately, it's it's not like any of this stuff can really be decided at, at a federal level anymore. I'm confident Should that be. that is – I think I'm pretty sure that that has failed us, and I don't think that it's going to come back until – unless – we get down to the county level to the state level and really implement these types of things that are going to keep our schools safe and secure truly and not through inclusion, but through security and like real stuff. Um, But trying to change everything at a federal level is not working. And um, doing it at the local level is the only thing that we really have left at this point. I believe. Yeah. Counties. Counties. And thank God we have a good sheriff here. And remember the last conversation with uh, Josie, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, she was, um, I guess very outspoken about it. And we, we have a sheriff here that should protect our rights as gun owners from the federal government, but things now are getting very gray and very weird. And so I think a lot of people are fearful with the new 85,000 IRS agents that there's going to be door knocking and, I just, I really hope that our country comes to its senses and we, we vote some decent people in. And, well, there might um, be a lot of dead accountants too. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. How are you going to, first of all, the IRS is not a constitutionally based entity. No. Second, you have the money system, which is not, it, it's a private company. It's the federal reserve. It's not the government that's doing no, this. That has nothing to do with. Yeah. This, no. this is not endorsed by the people. It was built by certain elected officials at the time that you know none They're of us private bankers on. this is private. generations ago yeah yeah and so now you have a non-government entity trying to be bolstered up by the taxpayers dollars without the taxpayers consent by 85,000 people now starting to investigate your wallet meanwhile with guns how many how many Trillions of dollars are unaccounted for yeah. in our government. And going you know, to Ukraine. Supposedly. Yeah. Supp- <laughs> Getting washed through Ukraine and coming back to uh, people in this country, unfortunately. Yeah. And again, well-meaning people wanting to save another country and playing on emotions and not realizing the actual, you know, the story is this is, this is theft and nothing more than that. It's people trying to acquire more power and um, at the expense of the average human beings, Mm -hmm. you know, life and liberty. Yeah. So crazy times. It is. It is. I think I got one last thing, unless you got more. No. We got uh, one of the things of like something I thought of is post-election accountability, whether it's Mm. at the county level or not, I think it should be through and through. But if you elect somebody to say city council and they campaigned on these certain values, then there needs to be like an audit three months later. Have they broken what they said they were going to do? If so, they need to be removed unless they have a very, very good reason that we all support as to why they did something different. Maybe new information came out and they had to adjust course. But if you campaign on something and then you do the opposite, 
that there should be a standard that we remove them from their position because they are not servants of the people; they are liars. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that all falls under treason. Personally, yeah, I agree. I, I see as anything that's used to um, falsify your actual intent. If you lie coming into office, you are, you know, you're a traitor to the people that you're, you're supposed to be a servant to the people and you're supposed to be representing people. And uh, at that point you should be removed and imprisoned. Mm -hmm. And there should be, there should be constant, like severe repercussions for people that do that. The most so severe that nobody ever should want to um, break the trust of the people their voting base. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Well, pay attention to your local stuff. Figure out what the major problems are in your area that are encroaching on your freedoms. And uh, do what you can in your household, in your neighborhood, in your community to uphold the standard of the spirit of freedom. Yeah. Thanks, Shane. Thank you. Appreciate it.